scripture reading in just a few minutes. One of the experiences that I have from time to time lately is two grandchildren competing to tell me what just happened at their house or their school or their playground. And they can't, they can't wait to be the first one to tell me about it. And they jump all over each other and make sure that the other one doesn't have much opportunity and, and, and then finally tell it all out the new thing that has happened. They are the first ones to tell me. And I've heard it from them first. So here's a question. Which Bible writer was the first to tell us about the resurrection of Jesus from the dead? And the answer is the Apostle Paul. Not what we would have expected. The Gospel writers, of course, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all go into quite a bit of detail about exactly what happened on that first Sunday morning. But it was likely the Apostle Paul, about 10 years before Mark wrote, and maybe even 40 years before John wrote his Gospel, it was the Apostle Paul writing to the Corinthians who told us first that Jesus had risen from the dead. So let's listen to that passage now. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting at verse 1. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But... By the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believe. This morning we begin a series of four sermons on this wonderful chapter, 1 Corinthians 15. It's all about the resurrection of Christ, and also, as we'll discover in the following, chap the following Sundays, it's also about the resurrection of the dead, our dead. We'll learn some great stuff about God's victory at the end of time, about going to heaven, about how we should think and act in the meantime, We'll be challenged about what we really believe about our bodies. Are they troublesome shells that carry a precious soul? Shells that we leave behind when we go to heaven? Or are they an integral part of our real selves, so important that we'll take them along to heaven? And we'll see that the answer to these questions has a profound impact on how we live day to day and how we think about the things that happen to us every week, every year. But before the arguments and the debates get hot and heavy, starting at verse 12, there are 11 glorious verses of basic gospel teaching, plain and yet precious to us. 11 golden verses about the greatest things that ever happened the most important things that happened to Jesus. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's start at the beginning of this passage, 
Paul starts out by reminding his brothers and sisters in Corinth, that's the fellow Christians there, about the gospel, the good news that was preached to them. In a, in a world that's filled with bad news, that was their situation and that's ours today too, in a world that's filled with bad news, the simple story of Jesus has invigorating life in it. It has positive news for us. God loves you and me so much that he sent his son to die for us, to take our way our sins and to make peace between us and God. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me and maybe even like you. And it tells the amazing good news of Christ risen from the dead. But before Paul tells that Jesus story in brief outline, we're still going to get to it, he tells his friends how important this story is. He reminds them again. He says, you received that gospel and made it your own. Not only was it preached in the beginning by Paul and others, but as a response to that preaching, to that gospel, they took it into themselves and they received the gospel. They, it became important for them personally. It wasn't just something way out there. It was something that had made an impact in their lives, in their hearts. Paul says, you've taken your stand on the basis of that gospel. When you trusted in Jesus and when you stood up before the congregation and were baptized, you've taken your stand. You've, you've made a statement that, yes, I believe in Jesus. And over and over through the centuries, it's amazing to read the stories. People have been willing to make that statement and take that stand, even in the face of the worst persecution and eventual martyrdom. Just say Caesar is Lord, they said to those early Christians, and they said, Jesus is Lord. And they paid the price for it, for taking their stand. This is the gospel we preached, says Paul. This is the gospel you received. You've taken your stand on it. And by this gospel, you are being saved. You've been rescued from the dominion of darkness. And you're being brought into the dominion, the kingdom, the realm, and the reign, and the rule of Jesus. You're redeemed and forgiven, and God is continuing to work that out in your life. Not only have you decided at a particular time in history, of your history, that Jesus is the one for you, or if you haven't done it yet, you may well do that later today. Not only have you taken a stand, not only have you been saved through Christ, but you are being saved continually by Christ, says Paul here in 1 Corinthians 15. So just remember, he says, just remember having laid this foundation of, of what's happened in their own experience. They heard the preaching, they received the gospel, they took their stand and were baptized, and they were, they're continuing to be saved by Jesus. Just remember, Paul says, hold on firmly to that word that was preached to you. Don't forget it. Don't, don't let it sift through your fingers like sand. Hold on tight. Don't believe in vain, Jesus, Paul says. Don't treat the gospel as just an empty promise. Instead, hold on tight to what you've received. Some of Paul's readers were losing their grip on the gospel. They were losing their nerve, their confidence, perhaps even their faith. And Paul reminded them of that gospel because they needed reminding. Brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of this gospel. I want to tell you again, even though you might have heard it a thousand times, because you and I have a tendency to hold it a little more loosely, to get involved in this or that or the other thing, and to let the central things of Jesus become less important. 
So don't believe in vain. Hold on firmly to the truth that you believed. I want to remind you, says Paul, of the gospel. A little girl once said to her baby brother, tell me about God. I'm starting to forget. Are you lessening your grip on God? Today, let the Apostle Paul remind you of the basics once again. So Paul says, he, I received this gospel from others and I'm passing it on to you. This is the last word of introduction. He, re- he prefaces his thumbnail sketch of the Jesus story in verse 3 by saying, I received this gospel from others and I'm passing it on to you. It's, he's, what he's saying to us is, I didn't invent this. I didn't make it up in my own head. It's not just my opinion. I'm not taking something I heard and then changing it around to blow it out of all proportion or, or to, to change it from what it once was. I'm just passing along what I heard, the apostle says. And our job is not to dress up the gospel or somehow to make it more palatable to modern people. We don't have to tone it down. We don't have to remove the supernatural reality from it. Instead, we just have to tell the old, old story in language that people can understand today. We just have to pass along what we've heard from others. Evangelism, said Sri Lankan evangelist D.T. Niles, evangelism is one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. And when you and I have experienced the difference that Jesus Christ makes, the only, the only thing that is first, of first importance is telling somebody else that it's true. Communicating the gospel, whether it be in preaching or evangelism or just one-to-one communication, communicating the gospel is something that happens because we've been impacted by Christ and we believe that others will be impacted too. That the same word and message that had life-changing effects for us and for all many of the people who are around you this morning, the same gospel that changed them can change the ones you're hoping and praying for. The ones that you surprisingly will get an opportunity to talk to later this week, perhaps. We don't have to be original. We don't have to be a star apostle like Paul. We just have to be somebody who's felt the impact of Christ in our lives, who's experienced the resurrection power of Jesus and someone who's willing to tell somebody else about that. Okay, so here's Paul's brief summary of the gospel in four bullet points. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried. He was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And he he appeared to many people. Somebody once said that the real test of your Christian witness is, can you tell somebody about Jesus while you stand on one foot? (laughs) Hmm. Christ died for our sins and was buried. He was raised and appeared, all according to the scriptures. There's lots to interest us here. For one thing, it's an historical story. These events really happened. Jesus died. Although every once in a while, some crazy person says Jesus didn't even exist. What ridiculous kind of assertion. All kinds of proof, both inside the Bible and out, that Jesus really existed. Jesus died. Our ancient creeds even preserve the detail of who pronounced the death sentence. How's that for ignominy? He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. Jesus really died. And as I mentioned to you last week, the, the, the Gospels are, are, are accounts of that suffering and death of Jesus. 
with extended introductions. They, they focus so much. Jesus died. He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. And, and when his body was just a heap, a lifeless, unbreathing corpse, they put that body into the tomb. And that was that. He was buried. That's the second thing. The Gospels tell us who owned the tomb, that there were guards posted around it, that certain women went to visit it, that there were rumors around that perhaps they had taken the body away before Jesus really died. That but over and over, the Gospels tell us Jesus was buried. His body lay in the grave from Friday until Sunday. And then Jesus was raised. He had been dead, but now he was alive. He had ended his life with a, as, as, as people who watched it from the outside experienced it, with a profound sense of, of disappointment for them. That, that it had all gone wrong, horribly wrong. But their hopes were given new life when Jesus was raised from the dead by the power of the Father. Jesus was raised. He had been dead, and now he was alive. And then he appeared. He appeared to a wonderfully diverse group of people, the women who saw him first, Peter and the other disciples in Jerusalem, then to hundreds of others in Galilee, including his brother James, and on and on the list goes. There were many witnesses. He appeared, not just to two or three people who had been convinced that they could make it up and get away with it, but he appeared to many people, to hundreds of people, and to people who, when they were later confronted with the reality of it and, and say, you know, it's all rubbish, isn't it? Just deny it and your life will be, you can go free, refuse to deny it. I mean, if, if, if you and I made something up about Jesus rising from the dead, the first time somebody said, you know, no lunch for you if you, <laughs> if you don't deny it, I would just deny it because it wasn't true. I made it up. But no one made up the resurrection of Jesus. And people went to their deaths insisting that it happened. These uh, four things, Jesus died, he was buried, he was raised, and he appeared. Th they go together in pairs, did you notice? Jesus died, and his burial shows that, proves that. He died a real death. His body was cold in the grave. And if there was any doubt about it when you watched him in the process of dying on the cross, there was no doubt about it when they took the body and laid it in the tomb. They knew what death was like. They knew it even a little bit closer than we do. And then Jesus was raised, and the long list of witnesses who saw him alive afterwards shows that that resurrection was true. Jesus was raised from, from death to life again, and people saw him alive. He cooked breakfast for them. He had conversations with them. He answered their questions. He talked to them for several weeks before he ascended into heaven. So these two things go together. Paul is determined to, to, to make it clear to us that, that the pieces fit and that these important things are things that we can remember as crucial and central. Let's go on a step or two further. This brief historical summary is also a faith statement. It's also a declaration by those who say it, that, that something important was happening even beyond the outward effects of, of dying and burying and raising and appearing. It's true that Christ died. That's what Paul says here. But it's also important to add that he died for our sins.
You can't see that by looking at the cross. You can see that through the eyes of faith. When you put Jesus into the big picture of, of, what, of how he lived and, and, and what he taught, when you put him in the big picture of the Old Testament preparing a way for Jesus and preparing a context, uh, especially about sacrifice, we, then we get an understanding that it's not just a death, it's a saving death. It's a death for sin. It's a death to rescue and reconcile. The implication when Paul says Christ died for our sins is that our sins were a problem. A problem that needed fixing. And a problem that Jesus was determined to fix. And he was going to do that, and he did that by dying. He died for our sins. He dealt with it because we couldn't, and he dealt with it in our place. He died so that we wouldn't have to die eternally. He died for our sins. It seems that Paul is uh, thinking back to various Old Testament scriptures, and in particular to Isaiah chapter 53, because this happened, this dying for sins, Paul tells us twice, uh, Paul tells us rather, it happened according to the scriptures. Scriptures like Isaiah 53, listen. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus died for our sin. And then, of course, Paul also adds that Jesus was raised to life on the third day in accordance with the scriptures as well. It's a little bit more difficult to point out exactly where, what Paul is thinking about here, but perhaps it's words like these from Psalm 16. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure. Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful ones see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. So not only do we get these four bullet points of what's most important, died, buried, raised, and appeared. Not only do we get these things in pairs so that, that they're kind of confirming each other, died and was buried, raised and appeared, but we get the, the interpretation that is important for us to understand that Jesus died for our sins and that he was raised by the Father, that God was in it, bringing Jesus to life again. And then come that long list of appearances. We're not going to go into them in, in any detail, but you can read about some of them as you look back into the gospel stories, the one we heard from John already this morning, and the others, of course, from Matthew and Mark and Luke. And you can read about, about how people were impacted by Jesus and given a, a new lease on life by his risen life. There are resurrection appearances mentioned here in 1 Corinthians 15 that we don't read about in the Gospels as well. Paul says that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters, some of whom, 20 years later, are still alive. Go and ask them, is what he's challenging us to do, or at least challenging those Corinthians to do. And then, says Paul, in a change of tone and, and in an addition to the things that had been passed on to him from one to another ever since these events happened, then, says Paul, he appeared even to me. 
Last of all, he appeared to me also. Perhaps you've read the story in the book of Acts. Paul, it seems, never gets tired of telling it, and you can find it in three different places. There on the Damascus Road, about two or three years after Jesus had ascended into heaven, Jesus surprised Paul with a private audience that literally knocked him off his horse. The risen Christ showed up in his experience to make an impact on his life as well. It can happen at the strangest time. Paul actually uses an odd phrase here as to one abnormally born is the the way that he explains it. It's kind of like a premature birth, except this one happened after it should have. Paul kind of wished that he would have been there when Jesus had been raised on that Easter day. But some months later, it was as if Jesus appeared to him there on the road. And Jesus can appear even when you don't deserve it, as Paul clearly thought he didn't deserve it. Because he had persecuted the church of God, he explains, even despite that, though, the grace of God had been given to him in a a knowledge of Jesus Christ, the risen Savior. And Jesus Christ still appears still impacts people today. Jesus Christ still bursts to life in people's experience on days like this in Halifax, Nova Scotia. He still appears to us as to one abnormally born who 2,000 years after it happened are still hanging on the words of Paul and hoping beyond hope that it's true and asking that Jesus would come and be personal to us and, and, and have that kind of saving effect in our lives as well, a revolutionary effect that would rescue us from sin and reconcile us to God and make a difference in our relationships with others and give us a new lease on life, even eternal life that lasts to heaven. So, that's the Cole's notes version of the gospel, says Paul in verse 11. But it's never just a matter of this is what happened to Jesus. It's a matter of what the church proclaims and what you and I believe. And just as Paul started off 1 Corinthians 15 with that reminder that that was what he had preached and what they had believed, that's how he ends verse 11. He reminds them this is their common inheritance. This is what they stand on together. A Christ who has been dead and raised. This is what we preach, and this is what you believe. Well, just one P.S. to this. And that is, why did he write it? Why is he going on about this? Almost everything that Paul writes, maybe everything that anybody writes in the Bible, has a reason. You don't just sit down and write for no reason. Paul was writing for a particular reason. And his conviction, which we'll hear about later, another day, his conviction was that the resurrection of Christ was at the heart of the gospel and the resurrection of the Christian's body was a logical extension of this. I'm quoting from somebody I respect, Bruce Winter, a New Testament commentator. Not only was the resurrection at the very heart of the gospel, as Paul has explained to us this morning, but that resurrection is at the very heart of what we believe happens next in our short lives. When you and I stand on this very particular Easter day, an Easter day that has been preceded by the death of someone who sat over there for 80 years, On this particular Easter day, we need to be reminded again that because he lives, we will live also. And because Jesus was raised from the dead, everybody who trusts in that one will be raised from the dead as well. And I could hear all kinds of questions being 
popping up into your head about this. They're actually questions that Paul asks. Probably because the Corinthians had already asked him. And you'll hear about them in weeks to come. Let's bow in prayer. God, for some of us, this is just incredibly good news that we have believed already. But we thank you so much for the reminder of it. And for others of us, God, this is incredibly good news that we hardly dare to believe. That we have questions about, perhaps. That we want to explore more about. So help us, God, to do that. To not just leave it until some other special day. But instead to, to follow you, Jesus, until we too know what the truth is. And whatever our situation, God, we praise you for all that you've accomplished so far. In Jesus' name we pray.